Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms, um, sorry, who has blessed us in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. No, we're still awake. That's good. Hopefully, I'll be like a, a good espresso this morning, and I'll uh, put some energy into the room. But uh, we're going to look at Ephesians 1 to 10 this morning. But before we do, let me pray for us, and then we'll dive in. Father God, thank you for being bringing us together this morning. Lord, as we come to your word, we ask you to make it plain, make it real, make it clear so that we will be challenged to change. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I wonder when you hear the word church, what do you think of? What comes to mind? Is it a positive thought or is it negative? When you think of it, does it encourage you or does it depress you? See, church is one of those things that I've been thinking about all week. And in fact, we've actually been thinking about it together. See, last Sunday, David spoke about the significance of fellowship and what that means for us here. And on Wednesday night, we started to unpack that. And then we're back to it again this morning. So I believe before we even dive into the topic this morning, God is trying to get our attention. He is trying to pull us up by the bootstraps to heed, to pay attention, to listen to what he's trying to say to us through his word. You see, church is vital for our lives, but I also know that for many, it's a divisive term. See, if you ask somebody, David posed the question in the middle of the week, uh, who used to come to church, you'll get a variety of responses if you say, what does church mean to you? Some may speak of fond memories of great community and spiritual growth. Others, however, may tell a tale of hurt, of hypocrisy of feeling judged or excluded. See, church is a complex topic. It stirs emotions inside each and every one of us. And to be honest, church can be like our own family's content. It can either be a blessing or a head scratcher. I'll say it that way. (laughs) Because just like our families, churches can be a place of great love and support where we find belonging and connection, but it can also be a place of conflict and pain content where oftentimes we encounter disappointment and misunderstanding. But despite its challenges, despite the problems, there is a profound idea behind the concept of church. And it transcends most of our experience once we get hold of it. And as we read our passage, Paul wants to paint a picture, if you look at the whole book of Ephesians, of what church should be like. A family, God's family, made up of ethnicity, social groups, and all but under the banner of Jesus Christ. And as we talk about church this morning, here is the takeaway. Here is the thing I want you to get hold of. Now, does not think of church as one single thing or idea, but it is a diverse family made up of many different parts. But it's also a damaged family, because let's be honest, as we all walked in here this morning, we bring our own baggage, our own burdens and our own problems. And yet it is still a devoted family, one on the single focus of loving God and loving one another and bringing that together. Jesus, if you were to ask him, what does church mean? 
set his intentions in Matthew 16, 18, when he was talking to Peter about how he would build his church. And he said it should be a place of solidarity, a place of security, of, of challenge, of change and of restoration. And what he had in mind was that picture of family. Where this new community comes together and it's made up of all peoples and it represents the world that it's from. And so this morning, as we look at Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we'll see a church as God pictured it, especially in its introduction, because his intention for church was family, but not an exclusive family. But a diverse family. And you'll see that as I kind of paint a picture of what it is that this church was built from. You see, context, if you're reading the Bible, is so important. Because without context, we're just reading words and we have no idea why it's there. If you go into a classroom, before a teacher starts teaching, they will give the class context. And they hope that they listen. Uh, You'll know that if you've ever been in a classroom. But it's true. But the city of Ephesus was located in modern day Turkey. And I imagine the weather we've had recently, which is an anomaly in Scotland, is how it felt on the days that you were out. And this was a metropolitan city. And believe it or not, it was made up of between 250 and 300,000 people. It was a huge place. It was a hub of culture, of commerce. It had religious practices from all over the world. The city boasted this diverse population. It had Greeks, it had Romans, it had Jews. It had people from the European nations. It had people from the Eastern nations all mixing together. Because this was a hub where merchants and travellers would come all around. And so it's this metropolis. So think of us somewhere like London. Or Edinburgh or New York. These cultures on communities mixing together. And so the church there was made up of this. It wasn't just the people that lived there. Everybody came and descended in this place. It was multifaceted. It blended all these people together. Much like how families often do. Like my family has got an incredible nation as part of its family now. The English (laughs) <laughs> All right. I don't know why you laughed at that I think that's pretty good but this is a diverse family everybody coming together and you see that as Paul writes his letter look at the opening verses open your Bible, Ephesians 1 he says, Paul identifying himself by, uh, by the will of God to the saints this is the people the culture is the words there the people that Jesus has brought together To you in Ephesus, he says, and the faithful in Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father. Blessed be the God our Father of Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Listen to verse 4. Even as he chose you from the very foundation of the world. He doesn't say from the very foundation of the Middle East. He doesn't say from the very foundation of your little town in Madison. He says from the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. See, God's heart, as Paul writes this letter for his church, is to have a family which richly expresses the colour, the community, the beauty, the diversity that you see when you walk out the door. It's incredible. I go to, uh, is it Quarry Break Park just down the, the road there? And then you stand there and you look at the plethora of houses. It's like, who decided to put Madison together like this? Because mm-hmm. it doesn't look like your modern estate, does it? But nor do the people. And that's who Paul's writing to. His passion is to unite these people together under one place, the church. And so in his letter... We see this vision of diversity when we understand the context. And Paul wants to bring these together. And so he says to the church, this is an inclusive nation. I mean, this is staggering when you understand this melting pot of all these people that are mixing together. It's like walking around uh, one of the big, um, I'm trying to think, Brayhead. You think when you walk down the streets there, I mean, can you imagine Paul's man? You can see the streets in Ephesus, all these people mixing together. And the plan that God had for this is no accident. 
This is intentional. God wants a, a diverse family. He says even before the world began, before the foundation of the world, God had this in mind. You see, Paul speaks of how God put this family together. It was his sovereignty. He predestined all of these people to be adopted, brought in to his family. This adoption wasn't based on any ethnicity or your social status or where you came from or who your father was or who your mother was. It was based on God's inclusive sovereign choice. Just take a minute to think about that. As I said earlier, when you walk into a church, sometimes when people walk in and it's their first time in, they can often believe this is an exclusive elite club, like a really posh golf course. You only get in if you've paid your money or if you qualify because you've got the right job. But not in God's family. Not in God's family. Here, God, Paul reminds us that God's plan was rooted in his choice, his sovereign plan, not our merit or our badge, or our privilege, but what he said. If we had time, we'd see how this world has been broken apart throughout God's story. We could think of Genesis 3 or Genesis 11, where it all breaks apart and scatters all over the world. But then God says in Genesis chapter 12 to a man, Abraham, he says this, through you, I am going to give you a family, and it's going to be like the stars in the sky. Over the last few weeks, we've had some incredible pictures of our universe, haven't we? If you were not like me and you weren't catching the back of your eyelids and you were up at midnight a few weeks ago, you would have seen the Aurora Borealis that was up the Northern Lights. And you, if if without light pollution and you're privileged here in Madison, you would have looked up and seen the stars. And they're all different sizes, aren't they? They vary. And this is a picture of God's church. It's one big old family encompassing all of the earth, made up of the least the world expects. It will be made up of every tribe, tongue and nation. I don't know if you've ever been to a place where you've experienced that before coming to MCC. I I went to uh, Cape and Ray Bible College. Um, This was an international Bible school. And so we had students from all over the world. We had Americans, Canadians, French, German, English, Filipinos, Koreans. I mean, you name it. It was a melting pot of different people all together. 150 of us was in my year. And I don't, uh, I think it's safe to say there was many times when things were said and it was lost in translation. Mm -hmm. So I said to one of the Americans, do you fancy going and getting a brew? And he looked at me and his face was in utter shock. He said, Mike, it's 10 o'clock in the morning and we aren't allowed to drink beer. I went, no, 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 no. I went a tea or a coffee. And don't send me to the principal because he didn't know what I was talking about. Because we've got mannerisms, don't I? When I came up here and they said, you're Ken. I was like, who's Ken? (laughs) And when when do I get to meet this guy? Because everybody talks about him, but he means you know, doesn't it? But when you're in somewhere like that, it's this incredible experience of cultures, backgrounds and stories. Of who God brings together. I mean, who could, but God could bring this many people together. Would you naturally turn up and sit with the people you're sitting with this morning? Probably not. Think about that for a minute. Just think about that. Who but God could put them together? You know, you look around the room right now. Just look to your left and your right. And this... This church is filled with rich, poor, old, young, wise and foolish. I speak of myself there. But everything in between. It's incredible. Each person, each one of you sat there this morning has a unique story, perspective and set of experiences that you bring into the table. And yet despite the differences, we are brought under this common banner as Paul speaks of here of Jesus Christ. And that diversity is not a coincidence or a side effect of being in a community. It's a reflection of God's intentional design for his family. It's what he always wanted. You see, he called the people from every nation and background to himself through Abraham, and he continues to do it today. You see, it's through our differences that God brings us together. So we reflect the richness of his character. We see glimpses of his nature. Each of us uniquely crafted. The the Bible says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made by God. 
And when you come together as this church, you are this rich tapestry of grace and love poured out on you. I don't know if you've actually realised this, but take a look around the room. We are a rich microcosm of what one day heaven will be like. Because it will be of all nations. This diversity, though, will bring its challenges, won't it? But it will also be an incredible opportunity for us to grow, to thrive and to come together. My friends, when you look around this room as I do, we need to give thanks for it. We need to pray for it and we need to protect it. Because we will find that being part of such a diverse family will bring challenge, won't it? You cannot bring together this many people uh, from every corner, society, culture and status and not expect to find difficulty. Because the Bible tells us that despite being a diverse family, we are a damaged family, aren't we? Look at verse 7. As Paul unpacks that, he says, In him we have redemption through blood, forgiveness for our trespasses, according to the richness of his grace. Hang on a minute. Did you stop there and go, hang on a minute. Why do we need redeeming through his blood? Why is that necessary? Or what, why do we need forgiveness? Or what are trespasses? Well, it's simply we are broken. We are broken and fractured people. And nobody that walks through this door is perfect. There's a story told of uh, a perfect couple where a perfect woman met a perfect man. And after the perfect courtship, they uh, spent a perfect life together because they were perfect. However, one stormy evening, Christmas Eve, this perfect couple were driving down a windy road when they noticed someone on the side of the road in distress. Being perfect, what did they do? But stop to help the individual that was in distress. When they got out of the car, who stood there but Santa Claus with a whole series of toys? Well, not wanting to disappoint the kids, they got Santa and all of his toys and they put them in their vehicle. You may be asking, how did they do that? They're the perfect couple. They had the perfect vehicle, all right? And it's a story. But unfortunately, as they went along to deliver these presents, the weather deteriorated and the perfect couple had an accident and only one survived. Who survived, you might be asking? Well, obviously, the perfect woman. Because in reality, we know Santa doesn't exist and nor does the perfect man. <laughs> but wait, before you get overconfident there. Because that means that there was only one person driving and that was the perfect woman. So she was the cause of the accident, which tells us what? No one is perfect. <laughs> but the reality is, if you find the perfect church, leave because you'll probably ruin it. Now, I don't say that, all right, to write anybody off this morning, but it's just the truth. As we sit here this morning, no one is perfect. Not one of us. Here in verse 7, Paul highlights the fundamental truth about the human condition. We are flawed and in need of forgiveness. He emphasizes that because he says it's because of the blood. Only the blood of Christ could wash us and make us clean. And this is the ultimate expression of who God is, isn't it? He draws us together. Paul's acknowledgement is that our need is a sobering reminder that we here in the church are not immune from imperfection. We are broken, aren't we? You see, despite our shared faith and our common purpose, we grapple with our own brokenness. And we grapple, believe it or not, with the brokenness of other people. Because that's the human condition. Just like any family, we're not immune to conflict. We are loaded with misunderstanding and sin. And I'm sure you already know this. Ladies, you are not sat next to the perfect man. And nor men are you sat next to the perfect women. And nor is anybody sat next to the perfect child. Because if I find them, I'll make sure that they don't leave because I would quite like that in my house. <laughs> but we all have our own struggles, shortcomings and brokenness, don't we? We have our own weakness inside. We know that is true because that's what causes division and split and breakups between us. And even our, on our best day, when we try to show the shiny world, the perfect image of us, it still falls so far short, doesn't it? 
it still fails to reach the standards we'd hoped for. But Paul says, don't worry. I know you're broken. I know you're a failure. And so does God. He paid the price through the sacrificial death of Christ. We are given the hope and the forgiveness and the opportunity for new life. Mm -hmm. I can hear some of you saying, if this is your first time in church, back on. Isn't this God's church? Isn't the way everybody sitting here is supposed to have it all together? The reality is nobody does, especially David, especially me, especially anybody else that you meet in this building. We are all broken. But the church is not a place for perfect people. It's an adoption centre. For broken people to become part of a family. I like me one more story from my days at Cape May. I remember as students being called into the lecture hall. And at the front, we had the principal of the Bible school. And we had the uh, director of the Bible school. And they said, great right, guys, we need to talk to you. We're getting a new student. And the new student is coming from the local prison. And we were like, oh, that's good. And then he informed us that uh, this individual had been serving a significant sentence, sentence, I can't even say that, a significant sentence for aggravated assault that had nearly killed a man. So now I know what you're asking, because it's the same question we were all asking. Whose room is he sharing with? Well, I didn't need to answer that, ask, ask that question for very long, because he was sharing my room. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know whether it's because I looked like I should have been in prison when I was there and it would have made him feel more comfortable. But I can certainly tell you that it was a challenge sharing a space with someone whose troubled past was as difficult as his. But then think about that. If we knew everybody's story in this room this morning before they knew Christ, wouldn't we find it difficult to spend time with them? If we knew the reality of what was going on behind the windows that we call our eyes. Mm. But as I got to know him, I witnessed a remarkable transformation. See, through this loving support of the family at Cape and Ray, this mind found healing and restoration. He found a new focus in life. In fact, when he left that school, he became uh, the Bethany Trust that goes and reaches addicts in Edinburgh. He set up his own trust down in Carlisle to go and reach similar people. Why? Because he recognised that the church is not a gathering of perfection, but a family of damaged individuals who are being redeemed and restored daily by the grace of God. And yes, 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 we will make mistakes. What family doesn't? But our heart, especially here at MCC, is that we are a community who is journeying together towards wholeness and healing. We have our different struggles and scars, but we share one common thing. We have been saved, redeemed, washed and made new by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we are committed to each other, aren't we? Aren't we? And this leads me to my final point, because, yes, we're a diverse family. We are a damaged family, but we are a devoted family. And this is what Paul finishes with, because he, he, he brings all of that into play, because he says you're devoted to your king's mission and to one another. Verse 8 through 10, God lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to whose purposes? His purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to what? To unite all things to him, things on heaven and in earth. In these final verses, what we see Paul doing is he's emphasizing God's lavish grace and his wisdom. God has revealed to us the mystery of his will through Christ and we, with the ultimate purpose of uniting all things to himself on heaven and on earth. And this unity is the culmination of God's plan. This is what church is to the fullness of time. A devoted people firstly experience his devotion to us through Christ and then our devotion to him and to one another. And what is that seen in? It's seen in the gospel, isn't it? 
That's what the gospel is. It's that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's understanding that in reality, God, who had every right to judge and condemn and wipe the world clean, did not but showed his devotion through the grace and the love by providing our way out himself. Because he knew we could not attain it. You see, therefore, we are a devoted family. We are called to participate in that divine plan. We are called to embody unity and to love Christ, to be agents of reconciliation and healing to a broken world. You see, despite our imperfections, and I don't understand why God does this. I really don't. Despite our brokenness and our imperfections, he uses us to, uses us, sorry, to be part of his redemptive work, to be vessels of grace and instruments of peace. And here at MCC, we are not just a gathering of individuals, but we are a family, a family with Jesus in common. And we are committed to loving God and loving one another, to supporting and encouraging one another on our journey of faith. This is why we bang on every week about growth groups. This is why we want you to come. We want you to experience something that honestly, if you'd have been here last week, we were talking about tears and triumphs and testimonies of what was going on in our lives. And honestly, it's so rich. See, growth groups are not just an exercise in intellectual success, what I know up here. But it's the reality of up here, finding the core down here, where we become a family that supports one another. That loves God and loves each other. That's what we're here to do. It's where we champion each other to live for God every single week. It's where we pick one another up when we fail and when we fall down. Because yes, we do, don't we? I'm not on my own there, am I? No, there's a lot of faces going like this now. But it's where we support one another. It's where we pray God will use us to work in each other's lives and the lives out there. You see, growth groups are a vital part of being a member at MCC. They are so important and we commend them to you. And I promise you, see, if you came on a Wednesday evening, you would have your socks blessed off. I don't even know where that phrase comes from, (laughs) right? Because nobody wants my socks off. (laughs) But you would literally be blessed beyond anything you can grab hold of. Because God will show you what he can do through his word and through his people. And it will honestly be incredible. And do you know what, MCC? We go beyond that, don't we? Because we don't just invest in the spiritual. We're invested in the physical, the practical and the material. We as a family are so grateful for you here at MCC. Because you have gone beyond expectations, some of you more than others. You've sacrificed in order to be able to enable us to come and do the work and the mission here. And we are so, so, so grateful. It's incredible. But our devotion to church extends beyond the walls of it, doesn't it? Because we are called to be a light in our community, to reach those in need, to share the hope and love of Christ with the world around us. And as we live out our faith in practical ways, guess what? We become living, breathing, walking testimonies to what God is doing in our life. How the grace of God is demonstrating his will and changing us from the inside out. My friends, if you'd have met the guy at Cape and Ray before, you would have never, ever gone near him. But to see him now, to see him now, to walk with him now. I can think of so many from every church I've been in over God's journey with me. And we are never, we can't see it in ourselves, can we? It's only when somebody else says you are different that we see it. But this is what God is doing through us. I think of the Thursday morning cafe. If you're there on a Thursday morning, you'll see Will, uh, right, despite him being in utter agony 90% of the time, making coffees. And his coffees are absolutely banging, by the way. Mm -hmm. But you'll see Heather there. You'll see 
uh, Moira there, you'll see, you'll see so many of the team there. And then you'll see the community coming in and mixing and getting alongside one another and experiencing what it is to be a believer and what it is to share the gospel and what it is. And yeah, you know, you think about next week when we're going to be baptizing individuals, some of those individuals in this church today are because of the community cafe. My friends, this is what we want to see, isn't it not? We want to uh, get hold of the concept of church as God's family. We want to embrace the diversity that we see represented here. We want to acknowledge, yes, we are broken. We're never going to be perfect. But we want to commit ourselves to being a devoted family. To walking alongside each and every one of us every day that we might live out and reflect the love and grace of our Heavenly Father. So that we can see him welcome people to seek refuge and to be pointed to the incredible Christ that has saved us. My friends, that is God's goal for this church. That is God's concept. That's his picture. That's his painting. Are you willing to be part of that this morning? Are you up for it? Is that what you want others to see? Is that what you want them to engage with? Because it's certainly what I want them to. So let me leave that with you. We are a diverse family. And it's beautiful. We are a broken family. And it's a shame, but God's working in us. But we are a devoted family that will care for one another. So let's go and live that out. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for the privilege of being called to be your children. For the blessing to be part of your family, the church. Help us to embrace our diversity. Extend grace and forgiveness to one another because we are broken but be devoted to the purpose of your will in all that we do. Mm -hmm. Father, empower us to be agents of reconciliation, healing to this broken world, Mm -hmm. that your kingdom may come, that your will be done in earth as on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen.